Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Fertilizer is essential if you want a thick carpet of grass in your yard. Today, we're gonna to talk about how much, how often, and how to do it. Also, you can enjoy your harvest all year long when you can. Today, we're canning green beans. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. Booker T. Lee. Mr. Booker is a UT Extension agent right here in Shelby County, Tennessee, and Ms. Kathy Faust will be joining me later. All right, Booker, let's talk about fertilizing. Okay, let's do that then. All right, because there's actually an art, right, to spreading. Spreading fertilizer. fertilizer. Yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. what do we need to know? Well, one thing about fertilizer is, is first thing you need to do is do a soil test. Okay. Before you start putting any kind of fertilizer down, you need to know how much to put down. And the other thing you need to check the soil pH. That's very important right. too now. Because without the soil pH being correct, with, with all the fertilizer you put down, it's not going to be used by the plant. Okay. So for most lawn grasses, you need a pH between 6.0 and 6.5. Okay. And the only way you can tell that is do a soil test. Then to come back and start putting fertilizer down. Okay. When you start putting fertilizer down, two things you need to do. If you said put 100 pounds down, you want to go 50 pounds one way and 50 pounds the so other not way. not all 101 not, fell swoop. Because okay. you could yeah. miss spot. I've seen a lot of folks okay. that cutting the grass, putting fertilizer down. You see light green, dark green, <laughs> light skips. green. Okay. They don't skip some spots in there doing okay. that. And the same thing about your lime. When you put the lime down, do the same thing with your lime, putting it down to make sure you get a good coverage. Okay. And the important thing. Another thing I see, you might see sometimes in your neighborhood. When people put fertilizer down, fertilize the grass. Not, you, the, not the sidewalk. Yes. You want to make sure that grass get right on, on, on on the grass, on your lawn, right. where it needed. No, because and, if it rains, you know, those pellets are going down the storm drain. Don't the storm drain. Yeah. And that'd be a that's problem. Right. That's a problem. And that's right. why we get a lot of things take off the market because we miss you when they do that's test right. the environment there. See the water got some fertilizer, some chemicals in there. Okay. So make sure you put right on the grass. And I try to fill out my grass when I know it's going to rain. Okay. I try to make sure that when, it, when you put it down, if it doesn't rain, you water it in. Okay. Because sometimes it could cause problems in there. Because yeah, it definitely has to be watered in. You got to be watered right. in. Okay. Yeah, put it come activated and stuff and doing good. Okay. Where you want it in your lung. Sure. So then I want to spread this in. That's some fertilizer okay. in here. This is a nitrogen fertilizer. I'm going to put it down. Okay. I'm going to go up here. I'm putting it down there. See the fertilizer coming out of there? You don't come over. I see why I'm I hitting it right here. Make sure I don't miss no spot that is still. Then when I make my last turn that way, I start going this way. And that means I'm getting a good coverage on that grass. You get a good coverage, I'm not missing no, no spots or nothing. So I can cover all that grass right now. Didn't miss a spot. Now, we, now you got a pretty <laughs> green grass when it rains. You won't see no light green and dark green. And that, we so no that skips? Like, no skips. Uh. So I, cut, I put 50 pounds, if I put nine, I put half this way, half that way. And doing that, so that make it have a good coverage. Okay. Now, if I had a bag of fertilizer and I had my spreader here, what if I, you know, drop some on the ground? What would happen then? Look here. You see this green, but this spot here? Yeah. That what happened? They weigh some right there, and it's turning brown in there. Okay. But look around there. And that's what nitrogen do to your fertilizer uh, in there. Fertilizer do make it really pretty dark green. See that? Uh huh. It make it grow and turn it green. All right. And that's what they're doing right there. Fertilizer turn it green, so they're doing that. But try not to waste no when you're doing that. Because it will uh, burn. It will I mean, burn. As we can see there. Right you know, there. You see that, that right there. It will burn. You make sure you uh, take care of that. If you, if, you, if you weigh some, try to get it up. Put it back in your spread. Okay. Uh, then try to water it in if you can. Okay. So the most important part once you get all of this spread is to do what? Water it in. Water right? it in. Well, that's why I try to wash the weather. Put it down when it's going to rain <laughs> and, and doing that. Right. So that, you know. Because, again, if you don't water it in, you're going to get the brown spots. Brown spots. The another thing, you don't want to fertilize your zoysia grass mm -hmm. with a nitrogen fertilizer until it all the way out of the dormancy. Okay. You don't want, then you don't want to fertilize with a nitrogen fertilizer when it get ready, when it get ready to go dormancy. Okay. Probably about a month before it start going dormancy, hold back on your nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. Cause you don't want to get no growth going into the winter month. Right. Mm, so they do that, okay. so that's good. Right. And, and that would be for your warm season grass? Warm season grass. Okay. Now, fescue, that's a, that's a cool season grass. Right. He start picking up during the fall of the year, start growing then. That might be want to start fertilizing that. Okay. When it start to grow. You don't want to give it no why just dormant, especially nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. Somebody got nitrogen in there. All right. And on your bag of fertilizer, of course, you have those three numbers. So three you want numbers. to tell us again about those three numbers? You said that we have an incomplete fertilizer, a complete fertilizer. If you got all three elements in there, yeah. that means that's a complete fertilizer. If one of the numbers missing, that means incomplete fertilizer. Okay. Yeah. But on the bag of fertilizer, you might see some numbers just call some numbers out, like 10, 10, 10, 
13, 13, 13, 13 on there. But the first number is nitrogen. Right. Second number is phosphate. And the third, they're going to be potassium. potassium. It's always all, all going to be like that. If one old number missing, it, it, that, that means that element is missing okay. in that fill out. All right. How often would you fertilize? It, it all depends on how often you fertilize your grass. Right. Depending on when you're putting down in there and what the soil test comes yeah, every day. Right. Probably no more than three times during that, during that growing season. Right. And, and based on the soil test, what you put down. So how much fertilizer do we need to make our grass green, though? Well, normally, it, Chris, it's it based on your soil test recommendation. Mm -hmm. If you got a big yard there, any kind of nitrogen fertilizer you put down, it's going to probably turn it green. You know, you put 50 pounds down, a 25 pounds down, a 30 pounds, it's going to, come, it's not going to turn it green some. But how much you put down during that growing season, that'll come back with your soil test. Right. Just say you need, you got an acre lot. It tell you to put, uh, you need 300 pounds of nitrogen a fertilizer that year. You don't want to put 300 pounds down at one time. You want to put, you might want to put uh, 100 pounds down now. Then come back another month later and put another 100 pounds down, or six weeks later and put another 100 pounds down like that in so there. So you can break it down. Break it down in there. Right. You don't want to do all at one time. Right. You don't want to over fertilize that grass too soon, too much fertilizer in there. Right. They can also damage your land when putting too much fertilizer on there help disease problem come in there. Right. So you want to get the right amount of fertilizer and don't worry tell everybody all every time it always do that soil test. Now soil test normally lasts for three years. Okay. You know your pH don't stay the same for about three years in there. Now a lot of things that your phosphate metallic is gonna get built up in the soil. Right. It normally stay there. But the nitrogen fertilizer you put down, it's gonna leach itself out of there. So and that's why they give you a lot of different recommendations putting fertilizer down. They might say put six, twelve, twelve down. That means you don't be low in nitrogen this time. Uh, you put uh, 13, 13, you're gonna equal amount of everything. And that depends on how you've been taking care of your grass. Right. You know, like, I take care of my lawn all the time. Right, right. Some people might not take care of their lawn, they just getting started off. They might need a little more fertilizer, might need a little more lime in there. Right. You just can't go out and put some down, because your neighbor put some down, he put a lot. His, his, his yard might be already good. Right. It might be already healthy. Your yard might be just beginning to start doing that. So you wanna make sure the wife said do a soil test, soil test. Before, you, before you get started off on there, because you don't want to put a whole lot of fertilizer down there, because you can't have too much in there. Cause on that sheet to tell you now, it, it, you're too high. You're too high. Now, you, if your pH is real high, you can add sulfur to that and bring it right. back down some to tell you that. Which will take a little while. Take a little while to tell you, add sulfur to your soil and bring it back down to that correct soil pH. Right. But like I said, most lawn grass in there need a pH between 6.0 and 6.5. That's for your warm season grass and your cool season grass. When I say warm season, I'm talking about zoysia grass and Bermuda grass. When I'm talking about cool season, I'm talking about your fescue grass okay. and maybe some of your blue grasses. And then so yeah, that's what I said. We all recommend do that soil test. Always. Now you choose your local extension service. They have soil boxes. Right. And they also have protection for fertilizing your lawn. That's right. And how much to put down for that growing season. Yeah, but please, you know, on the bag of fertilizer, there's gonna be some directions there Direction as well. There. How so much to we, put down? And how everything. much to put down? And right. you can you can adjust your spreader. Right. On that's there, how much to put down? That's right. And then so you don't want to give too much fertilizer. You want to get the right amount of fertilizer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the best doing doing that is know when to fertilize that grass. I did time for that when that grass begin to grow. And if you need to grow. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's yeah. We sure appreciate that information. Well, that's good. Thanks. Thank you much for that demonstration. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs>
one pound of green beans per pint jar. Okay. So if you were going to do a dozen pints, you'd get about 12 pounds of green beans. Okay. So you get your green beans ready, your pressure canner, and we like to have people come by the office, bring their lid, if they have a dial gauge, and let us test their dial gauge. Okay. And we test it at 5, 10, and 15 pounds of pressure. Uh, many times, maybe it's been in an attic, and the gasket has uh -huh. dry rotted. So we also tell people before they get started, they want to get a little bit of cooking oil, uh -huh. non-salted cooking oil, and oil that gasket. And they can learn from my experience. We forgot to do this one year. Remember, we had I to call y'all in <laughs> to get the lid I off. Do. So you want to go ahead and oil your lid before you get started. And then you want to have your um, lids simmering. We've got those simmering at 180 degrees. We have our jars. Ideally, we would have a huge stock mm. pot with simmering water, mm -hmm. but we don't have that. So we've cheated a little bit. <laughs> and so we've little. got four jars hot in a crock pot, uh, some water simmering because we're doing the cold pack. And then you want to have your canning salt, your basic canning equipment, the timer, and the rings, and also some pot holders. Sure. And your instructions. Even if you've done this a dozen times, you still want to have your recipe and read through it so you don't forget anything. All right, well, we're going to mm -hmm. let you go ahead and get started. Then. Okay, right. what we've done, like we said, we went ahead and we've got everything, the water that we need is simmering. So the first thing we're going to do is get one of our hot jars. And people say, well, why do you have to heat these jars up? If you don't have a hot jar and you put it in a hot pressure canner, what's going to happen? The jar will crack. Mm -hmm. Well, we may still have something crack, but we're going to go ahead and put these green beans in the jar. Okay, so you fill it up just about to the top? Just about okay. to the top. And then I'm going to get some hot water, very hot water, because mm -hmm. see we've got our hot jar. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go ahead and spoon that hot water into the jar. I may have to take some of these green beans out. We're just going to go ahead and experiment with this. And you want to fill it to within one inch of the top. That's okay. important because you want to have one inch of head space. Okay, so what we can do, ah, you have to push pack these it. down, you have to pack it down. Ah. And like we said, one inch, that's probably more than one inch. So we can just pour this out. Okay, pour a little of that out. Mm -hmm. And you may have to experiment. Okay, and we just happen to have a ruler here and these are in increments of a fourth, one half, all the way up to one okay. inch. Okay. So you see we're looking at about one inch. And then we want to run this down the sides of the jar to get out the air bubbles. Oh, see okay. all of those I air see bubbles? Yes, you do. Lots of air bubbles. These green beans are so pretty. <laughs> uh, I tell you, they're nice and fresh. Oh. Then you want to add one half teaspoon of canning salt about a half a teaspoon per pint. So why are we using the salt? Well, the salt helps in the preservation. And people have asked me, what's the difference between canning salt and regular salt? OK, here's the canning salt. You can buy it at any uh, grocery store. Mm -hmm. or But the this says pickling and canning salt. It's non-iodized, and it's a much finer salt than regular salt. You can see how fine that okay, is. Okay. But that helps in the preservation. Okay. So the next thing you want to do, you want to wipe the top of the jar. You want to wipe that real good. OK, let's see. I may be able to add a few more green beans in there. And I just happen to have some extra green beans. So we're going to put a few more green beans in there because you want to pack them down. Since you're doing pressure canning, what will ultimately happen when we take these out of the pressure canner? The green beans will rise to the top. Oh. And you might have two inches of water at the bottom, which is OK, but still you want it to, mm -hmm. to look good. So you have to put a lid on this that has been simmering 
at 180 degrees. So over here we have our pot and I've got this simmering at 180 degrees. Ah, so it's right on it. Yeah, and you can let these simmer for, for as long as you're doing your pressure canning, but you go ahead and you lift this out and you put it on the rim, okay. just like that. And then you so take you your, seal. you've got, see that little rubber on the rim mm -hmm. is going to adhere to it. And then you screw this band on just fingertip tight. Okay, just fingertip mm -hmm. tight, not too tight. And then we're going to take this and place it into the canner. Uh -huh. And if you can see the canner, we've got about two to three inches of water in our pressure canner. We also have a rack in the bottom of the canner. Let's say you've lost your rack somewhere. You can put a towel in the bottom of this, but uh, you've got to have something on the bottom of the rack. So we're going to go ahead and fill the other three okay. jars, and then we'll come back and start up again. All right. Okay. All right, so that was the last one. I was the last one. We've got all four, and we put these down in the canner, and now we're going to secure the lid. That's okay. the hard part. Oh, so this is the yeah, hard part. Yeah, because you've got two V's that you want to line up. Okay, see that V? Oh, okay. We're going to line it. that up right here. Just line it up. And it takes a little muscle, and you just you close this. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where your patience comes in. We're going to go ahead and turn up the flame. And what we'll do is allow this to vent for 10 minutes. Okay. It's going to take several minutes for steam to start coming out of this. But after we allow it to vent for 10 minutes, we're gonna put the petcock on, and then that is when our steam, uh, our pressure will start building, uh -huh. and we will count, after it gets up to 11 pounds of pressure, we'll begin counting 20 minutes, yes. and we'll let this pressure for 20 minutes, 11 pounds, and then we'll let it cool down we're not going to put cold water on it. Some people do that. We will just let it cool down naturally. And after it gets to zero, we'll wait an additional 10 minutes. Okay. All right, Ms. Kathy, we've been at zero here for about 10 or 15 minutes. So yes. are we ready? We're ready. All right. Even though I know it has cooled down, I'm still going to use okay, a sure. pot holder. Sure. And I'm going to take the pet cock off. And then we're going to open the lid. And you need to remember to tilt it away from you right. because there will be steam. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, so there's we're steam. tilting that away, and we're going to remove our jars. Okay. Oh, the water is still simmering. Okay, and you want to place them on a um, cutting board or a towel away from a draft, mm -hmm. and we're going to leave these undisturbed anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. Okay. And as the lids seal, we should hear a popping sound. It might happen soon or it may take several minutes okay. for them to pop. And like we said, these can be kept for up to two years. And let me show you some that I've done uh, in years past. These were done in June of 2011. Oh, and I found them tilted over and you see the white residue yes, on the bottom. That. These that are not, no, no, yeah. this is not good. You, they're discolored and you hear how that sounds. Okay. And the lid is puffy, so those are unsafe to eat. These I did in 2012. They remained upright in a cool, dark place and the lid is still sealed. Mm -hmm. No discoloration, no disco. right. still bright green. These are safe okay. and these I did this past Saturday. I did some salsa. And um, these are good, are too, good as well. for okay. up to two years. Okay. okay. So is there a publication about canning foods? Yes, we have a publication. It's publication number 724. Okay. And you can just go online, publication number 724, okay. and you can download it free of charge. Okay. Well, wow, there goes another pop. Oh, great. All okay, right. we're done with success. Ms. Kathy, appreciate it again. <laughs> Thank you, So Chris. professional. We do appreciate that. Thank, Thank you much. You. Thank right. you. We have an infestation of, of, of mealybugs on our mandevillas here. We're going to spray them with uh, malathion. Malathion is an insecticide uh, that's labeled for use on, on mealybugs. According to the label for mealybug control, uh, it's one tablespoon is recommended 
per gallon of water. So I had to do some math. This is a little over 12 ounces. That's about a tenth of a gallon. A tenth of a tablespoon is equal to about 1.4 milliliters. I actually have a, a measuring spoon, which is 1.25 milliliters. So I'm going to put a little less than my 12.8 ounces in here to make it match my 1.25 milliliters. So, you know, you got to figure all that out. It's so very important to, to follow the label instructions. So what I'm going to do, fill this up about half full. Now I'm going to uh, try to get my 1.25 milliliters of malathion in here. I'm going to shake it up and then I'm going to top it off with water. Okay, got that. And I'm going to shake it up again. Okay. And see, I got some on my hand. It leaked a little bit. That's why you wear rubber gloves. Very, very important. All right, here's our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. All right, these are good questions we have here. All right, so here's our first viewer email. What is the best way to spray and get rid of what I call mulberry trees? Okay. Their roots will sprout all over the yard, and I have a concrete ditch in my backyard that I can't get into anymore to trim them back because of age. And this is Larry. So he wants to get rid of what he calls mulberry trees. Mm -hmm. okay? And he wants to spray them. So what do you think about that? Well, a lot of times, though, they had a tree there and be something begin to sprout up all around there. Okay. Probably get something like a stump rod, stump root right away or something, just touch it on there okay. and spread it on there and see how they're doing. How they do on there, you might have keep doing it more than one time. Sure. Or one yeah. time not gonna do that, you know, they don't they don't come back again. Just keep putting on that. You got to have some leaves on there, a little growth on there for you can see it for it to go down to the root system. Okay. But you might want to try doing that on there and that will help some there. But you got to constantly do that. You're not gonna do that one time and say it's it, it, it done though. Right. It's gonna take some time. Don't take some time. Yeah, don't take some time. Yeah. Don't, don't think you're gonna do it overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I had it in my yard, I do the same thing, not more beer, but I had a little thing spread up like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So cut it back. Cut it back. All right. Let Something it, else you could do too. Let now, it grow. If you want to, you, if you want to, you can actually paint a 41% solution of a glyphosate. Okay. Right. The turgor pressure will pull it down, you know, mm. down into the roots. Yeah. It'll you know, take a little time. Take some time. You yeah. You can do it. You know, you can do it that way. And uh, also, but you definitely need to, you know, cut it back. And also need some, paint it. need some growth on that too. The little leaves on that. Oh, just a little bit. bit. A little bit on there. Just, just a little bit. Put it take down through there. Right. Right. But you got to constantly keep doing that. No, you got to keep doing it. That's for sure. You got to starve it out. The carbohydrates. And try to spray where you spray these in a ditch like that. Try to spray somewhere that they don't, it's not going to rain down there. They're right. not going to rain when we try to get into the drainage, drainage system. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I wouldn't spray. I would, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just paint. Paint, that'd be yeah. good, yeah. You know, I just paint that 41% you know, mm -hmm. percent solution of glyphosate or whatever you want to mm -hmm. use, uh, you know, to go ahead and uh, help have that, yeah. that, that stump rot right out. Stump rot right out, you know, yeah. Starve of its carbohydrates. Yeah, I wouldn't spray. Yeah, yeah, yeah just especially by that, by that drainage right. dish, too. Yeah, that could right. be something to think about, too. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, so there you have it, Mr. Larry. Hope that helps you out there. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have zoysia grass, okay. and it was taken over by weeds. <laughs> is it okay to use bonite herbicide now, and in a week or so, plant some more zoysia plugs? Mm -hmm. And this is Hope from Queens, New York. How Queen about New that? Whoa, Queens, man. New York. <laughs> All, right then. All right, so let's go back. So zoysia grass, but well, she wants to use bonite herbicide. herbicide yeah. We don't know what kind of herbicide that is. Not, uh, right? She mm -hmm. just said bonite herbicide, right? Yeah. Then she wants to plant a zoysia plug. Over so what again, do you think again, about yeah. that? Well, it depends, like you said, depending on what kind of herbicide you have in there. Okay. They, they read the label on there, and a lot of times they'll tell you how long you need to wait before you can plant something back in that right. area. But since you're just doing plug, it, it should be okay just, just swap spread in there. As long as you put no seeds or nothing down in there, okay. it should be okay in there. But just read the label on there, see like a pre emerged herbicide, and see what kind of weed you control. Did she say what kind of weed? Uh, she said, just taking over by weeds. Oh, she ain't so kind of weeds. Yeah, you need to identify what, what, what you're trying to kill. Right, yeah. You right. Can't just That's right first and, and foremost. Yeah, right. yeah right. identify. You can't right. just try to start spraying stuff. You know, right. No, 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 spraying it first, though. So right. Try to identify the weed that you're spraying on there. That's a good point. And what herbicide do you do in there, but seem like they're like a pre emerged herbicide. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. We don't know what kind of weed, nor no do we know what kind yeah. of herbicide you're going to use to control said weed. It's a weed. That's a weed, yeah. You know, in there, in there. So, yeah. Okay. So, as long as she doesn't use. The seeds, she's using Zoysia Plus. Yeah, so yeah, should, should be okay. Yeah, it should be okay, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Hope, so there you have it. Make sure you identify that <laughs> weed first so you have the right herbicide to control, control those weeds. Yeah. And then make sure you read and follow the label. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. All right, here's our next Vera email. And this is one we seem to get a lot. Yeah. I need to prune my Encore azaleas, but okay. I don't know if I can do that before next spring's bloom. Okay. Can you please tell me the correct time or times to prune Encore azaleas? And this okay. is Yvette. 
from Memphis, Memphis Tennessee. Tennessee. So when is the correct time? <laughs> well, to prove no, no, encore. 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 Normally bloom, normally bloom in, the, in, in the springtime okay. and again in, 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 in the fall. fall. Yeah, right. they, they bloom normally twice in there. Okay. But the ideal time be the best time to prune those in the, at the first bloom right, right. In, in the springtime. Right. You want to spring in there. Right. It might slow your fall bloom down just a little, a little bit in there. But you go up and prune them in the fall, if you don't do it the right time and they put some new growth on there, in the cold weather gonna in the cold weather hit, it could damage your plant. Oh, it definitely can. It could damage your plant. Then you might then you will have less blooms in in the springtime. So the ideal time be the best time to prune that in the springtime. Once they finish blooming now, you might be slack on your second bloom, but if you prune early enough when they finish blooming, they might have time to set more more buds on there. Okay. In there, yeah, but the encore, they, they, they don't bloom twice in there. Bloom twice. Yeah, my mom has encore zayas at home. She's always asking me this question. So this could be my mom's question. But and anyway, yeah, after they finish blooming, blooming in the spring is yeah. when you should prune, prune those. Prune, yeah. Not in the summer. Not in the summer. Not in the fall. Not in the fall, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So for maximum bud set, it has to be after they finish blooming fin in the spring. In the springtime, yeah. yeah. Any other time, yeah. you're not going to have blooms the next spring. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> then then you're set. We get that call a lot of times. We time. do get it called a lot. So When the prune old plants in there. That's right. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. Good question, though. So there you have it. That's you a bet. good question. Okay. Yeah. Spring. spring. After they finish blooming. After they finish blooming, yeah. All right. There you go. All right, Booker. It was fun. I just, oh, man, that's it. For being here. That's <laughs> it. I'm ready for another question, man. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> we'll say that for another time. Okay, Thank then. you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. FamilyPlotGardening.com has tons of gardening information you can use. We have more about lawns and preserving your harvest. Go take a look. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.